All right, well, let's get going. Welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'd like to start off um, with introductions. Um, to myself, Rory Johnson, the county executive with Open Space. I've been with uh, Open Space for uh, going on three years now. Um, I oversee uh, general contractors in the Northeast from New Jersey up to Maine. Um, and excited to uh, kind of go over a bunch of different, uh, you know, use cases for open space and, and introduce a couple of our, our uh, clients who have really leveraged the tool um, to improve projects they've been involved with. You know, one of the things that I wanted to highlight during this uh, webinar was just the real life experiences of people. You know, it's one thing to hear it from Tom or myself or some other people at open space to describe, you know, how you can use it and, and what benefits there are. It's another thing to hear it from people that have actually used the tool in the field um, that I think can be much more impactful. So um, with that, you know, uh, joining me today is also Tom Gutowski. Tom, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Gutowski. I'm the solution engineer based in the Northeast. Uh, so I work closely with Rory and I oversee the accounts ranging from Maine down to Florida. Um, I was living close to the Boston area. For any of you South Shore people, I recently moved to Marshfield, Massachusetts about a year ago. Um, been at Open Space for about two years. It'll be two years in October. And prior to Open Space, I was with Consigli Construction uh, on the PM side for about six years. So I worked out of their uh, Boston and Milford offices, did projects ranging from historical renovations to lab and classroom spaces, the long-term healthcare facilities. So thank you all for joining. I'll pass it off to uh, Natalie from Commodore. Thank you, Tom. So um, my name is Natalie Asens. I'm a project executive uh, for Commodore Builders. Uh, it's a veteran-owned uh, New England-based construction management firm around uh, 550 million annual revenue. I'm uh, currently working in the public group. And uh, aside from being originally from France, in case you didn't get it from my accent, I'm also a huge fan uh, and early adopter uh, for from Open Space. Thanks, Natalie. Um, John Henry. Hi, everyone. My name is John Henry Nierday with uh, Westville Construction Managers based in New York. Uh, we do about 150 million in volume a year. Uh, I specifically oversee the growth of our BIM DEC department specifically offering uh, services externally um, to other partners. Uh, yeah, looking forward to today's conversation. All right, thanks everybody. And uh, just to give you guys a, a breakdown of, of how we're gonna go through this, um, you know, I wanted to go from beginning to end of a project to kind of hit on all of those critical points um, so that you, you could see where uh, open space could be useful at each of them. So, you know, pre-con and buyout, existing conditions, coordination, uh, risk mitigation, and then close out. And then I'll also touch on uh, insurance savings um, at the very end. <clears throat> but then we'll open it up for a little Q&A as well. And Tom, uh, I'll let you take off from here with the pre-con and buyout. Great. Uh, yeah, we want we wanted to start with pre-con because a lot of times Rory and I on our check-in calls uh, we find that current customers aren't thinking to use open space as early as that as the pre-con phase. And so some estimators and project managers are sometimes missing the opportunity to leverage those open space captures um, when buying out the job. So when I was at Consigli, we included these walkthroughs as part of sub bid packages. It just kept everyone on the same page uh, and, and held everyone accountable. Uh, so whether you're sending out the sub bid package, or if you're uh, wanted to pull these up during your D-scope meetings, or if you're doing constructability re reviews with the design team, you have something that you can reference back to. So I'm gonna hop out of this presentation for a minute and just show you what that looks like. We talk a lot about how open space has unlimited users and unlimited data. We also have shared folders and shared folders is gonna allow you to choose exactly the information that you wanna share with a particular person or with a particular group. So as it relates to pre-con, you could create a folder, whether it's called pre-con, sub bid folder, bid folder, whatever it might be. And when you create that folder, you can then take the walks and put them into that folder. And then when you click on these three icons here and click on edit members, 
shared folders are always going to default to this public share link at the bottom as being disabled. But if you enable this and you copy this link here, you can blast this out at the very beginning of the project and the person on the receiving end will be able to click on it and open up directly into what you put in that folder. So now they have a full walkthrough. They don't have to create an account. They don't have to sign in. They don't have to jump through hoops to access all that information. So now you don't have to worry about relying on those one or two walkthroughs at the very beginning of the project. You always have something to reference back to as you're putting together pricing. And so moving kind of beyond the pre-con phase, we wanted to talk specifically about how general contractors are using open space to capture existing conditions. And so Natalie already introduced herself, um, but Commodore Builders out of Waltham, Mass has used open space pretty extensively. And Natalie, I know you've used open space to document existing conditions on a few different jobs. I was hoping you could talk through um, kind of how your teams do that and if you have any best practices uh, to share through that process. Sure, definitely, Tom. Um, so, I mean, for us, really, like, uh, the existing condition is really uh, to help us have this ability to reference back, you know, to the captures to see the existing condition. So I'll just um, reference back to a few projects I worked um, with Open Space. So this year, North Point, you know, we had to look at the road condition, and you know, sometimes what we realize is it's not right away. So what that means is we did a capture at the beginning of the project, and then we're turning it over a couple of years later. We wanted to see what it looked like, and we could see if there was any damages. So that saved us a lot of time, you know, uh, to look if there was any impact of something we did. Uh, another example would be uh, in uh, Dedham. So we, we did a new uh, public safety building. And part of the scope was uh, the demolition of an existing town hall. And we had to coordinate all the items to be moved, sold, because it's a public process, or discarded. And, you know, like this really helped. We used the tagging feature. And uh, this was uh, really a big asset to have that. And finally, like uh, on the project I'm uh, currently working on, uh, in uh, for the Holyoke Veterans Home that uh, is a very large uh, project in Western Mass. Um, we used uh, open space to survey the existing medical facilities. So, I mean, we're talking about like a $400 million project. You can see like on this picture that Tom is scrolling through on the left, the building is huge, but you know, there are residents there. So with limited access, you know, we can't just go back and bother people. So, you know, those captures are essential. So, Aside from that, it's really a great tool for coordination with the design team and the owner. So as I mentioned, the tagging, but also as you can see, like the 360, it's so much better to visualize, you know, exactly. Because sometimes, you know, if you just do still pictures, you can go back, but you can't really, you know, like identify exactly what you needed. So here you can turn around. And when I talk about visualization to kind of finish on this, you have to think about, uh, for me, uh, one thing that has been really great is the uh, remote visibility. So I started using open space at uh, DCR North Point that I was referring earlier. And uh, we started using it prior to COVID. But when COVID hit, it was instrumental. You know, like nobody, not everybody could come. And, you know, you, people could just like log in, look at the captures, see what things were happening. But I see that it's going to happen again on the project like that uh, Tom is showing, you know. $400 million project, but two hours from Boston. So our design team and the owners are in Boston. So two hours, it doesn't look like a lot, but it saves traveling time. People don't feel the need to necessarily go as often, but also like they can instantly look at the condition. So that means that if you need an answer, instead of having to wait, they can just like jump in and look at it. So, I mean, this is really awesome, but I don't know, Tom, if you have any other question for me or I think that's- no, I, I think that covers it. I just wanted to add, so you guys are doing a great job with the captures of existing conditions. Um, and you touched on it briefly, but using these tags here, uh, what we call field notes, what a lot of general contractors are doing are not only just walking the site, but they're using these field notes to call out um, actual like existing conditions, things that they want to be identified to cover themselves later down the road. So if you notice curving missing or the sidewalks cracked, um, they'll create a field note for that. You can create a tag called existing conditions, and then you can run a report after the fact. So 
you have a fully documented uh, site before you ever even mobilize. Um, and so we wanted to call that out as far as uh, existing conditions. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about just field notes in general. So these same field notes, if you aren't currently using them already, you can also use throughout the course of construction. And so field notes, you can add one of three ways. You can add them after the fact. So if you notice something on the capture itself, you can click that field note button. You can also do this if you're, say, project engineers going around to walk the site. They can take field notes as they're doing the walk. It's going to be taken directly from their phone. And then even if they're not doing a walk, if you had a couple of people out on site, they could be taking notes directly from their phone without having to do a walk. Regardless of which way you choose to do or create these field notes, we integrate with um, a variety of different PM platforms. And the goal here isn't to add steps for your team. It's the goal here is to streamline it and save time um, documenting issues. So we integrate with uh, ACC, BIM 360, PlanGrid, and Procore as far, as far as PM integrations go. I'm going to show you what Procore looks like. Um, the rest of them work exactly the same. Uh, but you're going to click on this, this Procore icon up here, and then it's going to allow you to link to an RFI observation or a punch list item. And when you push it over to Procore or ACC, all of these fields were already filled out on the open space side. And the biggest time saving piece are these three things that come in every time. So every time you push over an open space field note, you'll get a link that will jump you back into open space. You can choose to leave that in there or take it out entirely. You'll also get a link to the image and you'll get this report that's attached for every single item. So the efficiency piece and the time saving piece here is the time that's typically spent compiling these attachments. So rather than taking a photo, downloading floor plans, compiling them, marking it up, saving it, and dragging it back into whatever PM software you're using, that whole process gets streamlined. So that 10 to 15 minutes per issue um, starts to add up as you start to generate these issues on site. And so I, I want to transition from existing conditions and kind of the course of and taking these field notes through the course of construction and transition more to uh, coordination and some of the BIM tools. And open space is investing heavily in BIM because we think there's an opportunity to bridge the gap between the VDC teams and the actual project team on site. So we're trying to make it easy for the project teams to feel comfortable enough to navigate the model themselves so that they can answer their own questions. They don't have to be calling the VDC or MEP manager to get an answer. And Commodore Builders and Natalie and her team um, have been one of the GCs using Open Spaces BIM tools most successfully. And Natalie, you mentioned the DCR job. I know on that job, you, uh, you were using the BIM tools and you actually got the foreman behind viewing them and caught some issues. So I'll pull that project up and I was hoping that you could kind of tell us how you used it for QAQC. Yeah, no, definitely no problem. I mean, uh, as you pulled that up, as we all know, like coordination is really huge. And we know that these days the design team, they keep wanting to put more in less room. So it's a great tool to save time and money. So you can see here, like right behind where you were, like uh, at DCR North Point, we had a pretty packed corridor, you know, with lots of piping. You cannot see, but it's multi layers here. And uh, thanks to the beam feature, we quickly identified that the mechanical contractor was installing some piping, not per the coordinated drawings. So the problem is some of those guys, sometimes they only use like the 2D drawings and they don't really have 3D. So what we did is we set them up, you know, with the app, you can see like it's getting crowded here with multiple rows. And with the app, even less tech savvy people like that foreman, they were able to access the info and really like people got super excited. They were like, oh, wow, this is what it looks like. And then it started being like in the foreman's meeting, you know, I heard that, you know, that they were like, oh, let's talk about the model. Like, how can we like really like understand things better? Because it's 
it's, it's even impacting, like, say, the drywall contractors. Often, you know, we plan ahead, you know, to do tops. But, you know, like, when people, like, see it in 3D, it means so much to them, you know, the visualization. And they felt like, oh, it's like a video game. So it was kind of cute to see some um, more experienced foreman, like, suddenly, like, kind of, like, playing around the model and really, like, ripping the benefits from this tool. Uh, another example, I would say, is um, in uh, the Denim Public Safety. Uh, we had lots of design changes, and again, crowded corridor, crowded everything, and we had to re-coordinate because there were some uh, minor program changes. And uh, thanks to the BIM tool, we, it really helped us track and confirm all the BIM penetration. So as the steel was being erected, you know, we could actually like verify, you know, like, hey, do we have them all in the right spot, or do we need to add some based on, you know, at what point the steel was released? So really, like, uh, a great tool to kind of keep us on track, schedule and and money wise. So thank you for that. Thanks, Natalie. And what Natalie is referring to is actually just the the core BIM product that was available at that time. Um, we've also we've had a couple other webinars about BIM Plus specifically, uh, but we've added even more BIM based tools. So we have things like Save Views. So now your coordinator, whoever is comfortable navigating that model, can come in and hide certain layers for the team on site, and then they can save that view with or without a location. So if you wanted it with a location, you can save that view. This is with the ceilings off. And now say your superintendent or project manager doesn't have to learn how to navigate and hide layers. They can just click from that drop down. There's other things we're adding like um, the overlay feature where you can overlay elements of the model onto the capture side not intended for automated clash detection, but to help them coordinate the work in that area. Um, with BIM Plus, you can bring in point cloud data. So that point cloud is going to get overlaid onto the model side. So now you have everything in one spot. So we're really making an effort to bring in these simple tools that the project team on site's uh, comfortable using so that they can actually get the most out of that model um, and, and look at it more than just in coordination meetings. And another thing, just to hop in real quick, Tom, is, is multiple models. So you, along with the, the point cloud, you can also bring in multiple models with BIM Plus. So um, I know that that feature is a, a huge benefit for a lot of teams that, you know, the model may change or they might have a different model from the very beginning. Right. And so thank you, Natalie, for all that. But we're going to transition again a little bit to uh, risk mitigation. So Rory, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Natalie. Um, risk mitigation, uh, you know, obviously a big part here. So, so much of leading a project is mitigating the risk and proper planning to make sure that you're hitting milestones uh, so you don't fall behind, ensuring the resources are allocated appropriately so that you don't end up with shortages and a stalled project or wasted resources. Um, so making sure that there are clear channels of communication. Um, and then, uh, John Henry, uh, you can speak a lot to, to the historical records. So, you know, I'll, I'll let you go from here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, at Westco, we had a, um, we had a goal of capturing an update every two weeks a project is active. So we'll send our technician out and we'll capture the project every two weeks. But in addition to that, uh, there's certain mile points where we absolutely um, require a historical record, one of which is when MEPs are completed before sheetrock goes up and you know, walls are closed. So we have a historical record of what is behind each wall. Um, with that, we not only uh, you know have a visual record, but we also utilize uh, you know something that Tom you know, brought up earlier, using a little bit of a different fashion, you know, to point out um, you know. Uh, uh, things that have been completed and installed, and actually using the field notes to not only denote them, but then also um, there's an opportunity to upload a file and link um, of, uh, you know, for instance, all the submittal information. Um, so then that way it's, hard, it's easier for not only the project team to use it as a, um, the historical record, but then this can also be turned over to the um, 
to the operations team uh, for a visual operation manual. Um, so it's really, really helpful for not only uh, you know, the PM on the project, but then also for the end client. It's a huge value to them as well. Yeah, and Westfield doing a good job of that. So rather than those monster closeout binders, especially for a job like Natalie's, that's $400 million. You can use these field notes to upload all of those O&Ms, warranties, uh, approved submittals. So now at the end of the project, you can click on that light fixture and all of that information will pop right up. And John, just, Henry, do you yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and you know, Tom, you went over this as well, but the share function is is incredibly helpful as well. Um, because what we love about this is that you can make it public, you copy your link to a certain, it takes it to an exact point of the capture. So the end user, when they click on that link, it doesn't take it to the beginning of the capture. It's actually where you want them to start and look at. Um, so let's say if you're having a dispute with a sub on whether something was installed or installed correctly, um, it takes us the um, subject subjectivity out of it and it's very clear of what is there what was done so then um, we can um, find a resolution forward so really love you know it, it um, you know open space is very helpful but it also just streamlines a lot of processes where historically we would have to resort to you know going back to pictures or videos that was taken that was taken on site by either site super or another team member and for anyone that hasn't used the share links, uh, the screenshot on the screen uh, indicates that you have to log in. But like I mentioned at the beginning, you can set it up so it is public. So what we see a lot of GCs doing is um, they'll go to that specific spot in the capture. They'll grab that share link and then they can include it in an email. Uh, if they want to paste it into an RFI, they can do that. And then when that end uh, user clicks on it, uh, it'll jump them right to that spot like John Henry mentioned. And we'll, we'll cover one last piece with this risk mitigation. Um, and John Henry, if you want, want to talk through kind of the change order process and how open space ties into that. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously using the field notes, you know, you can create an RFI and make it very clear of, you know, what is needed, um, you know, and share it with all stakeholders. Um, but also too, I think a big aspect is um, our project managers utilize this you know, every week to show visual progress to clients. We just find that the more, you know, specifically for projects that maybe it's difficult for the, for the, um, you know, the owner or all stakeholders to visit the site. It's just really helpful for our team from a relationship standpoint to give them a visual and point out certain things where through an email may get lost, but through a screen share is really helpful. We just find it that um, you know, we find issues and resolve issues much further up the stream than historically, and you know, waiting until let's say the month end, you know, um, on-site um, uh, meeting, we can you know a week you know. The day that we find an issue, we can get the client on a Zoom and review it together and have a accurate visual um, to relate to. Yeah, and, and having the visual is great, but again, tying it back to field notes, what we see some GCs do is for every design change or bulletin that comes out, say bulletin seven comes out and it impacts you know, 10 different areas, they'll create a tag, a field note tag that says bulletin seven uh, and then they'll use field notes to tag each area. And then if you want, you can upload specific pricing into that field note for that area. So now when you sit down after the OAC meeting with the owner and you're trying to review bulletin seven pricing, you can just click between those notes. It'll jump you to each spot and then you can review pricing. So hopefully cut down on the red lines back and forth between uh, you, know, you guys and the actual owner. So thank you, John Henry. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about closeout. Yeah. Um, so closeout, a um, couple of different things. So, uh, you know, here is, uh, uh, I mean, it, it seems to be like the the, the um, uh, subject of, of this conversation, uh, field notes, where you can, um, you know, tag this as a punch list item. 
Um, and you can see at the top there, you can push this to, you know, whatever your preferred project management software is, whether that's ACC, BIM 360, in this instance, Procore. Um, and so you can go through at the, the very end and tag each of these punch items so that you have all of this information in terms of, you know, location, um, exactly a, a description, an image of that, and then a status of it. Um, you can see right here, here's the, the Procore punch item. Um, and so this, I know, has been uh, a huge time saver for a lot of teams, um, but also keeps everybody, including subs, on, on the same page. Um, so you are able to be a lot more efficient, make sure you get everything taken care of. Um, yeah, and just to piggyback off that, we're not trying to, we know a lot of you have very established processes uh, in Procore, ACC, Plan Grid. We're not trying to mess with that. Um, related to kind of the first piece that I talked about at the beginning of the call, the, the benefit of doing that punch list item in open space and then pushing it to a PM uh, software is that those attachments are automatically generated. There's so often where you have a big job and you have thousands of punch list items, the team sits down, you got to review them. And if someone gets lazy and doesn't put a photo or doesn't put a location, um, that particular punch items tends to get kicked down the road. So if you get in the habit of doing it through open space, every single time you push it over, you're going to have all of that context. So there's never a question of what is this item? Where is this punch item? Uh, you have all the information to kind of work through them. Exactly. Um, and also at the very end of the project, the offline deliverable. So at the end of every project as part of our um, base package, uh, you know, what's included is an offline deliverable, which is a zipped HTML file. Um, we send that to you. You can keep that for your records or put that uh, or hand that off to the owner. Um, I know owners love this because, you know, if they want to do uh, renovations in the future, knock down a wall, whatever, they're able to go back in through previous captures and see, all right, what's behind this wall, what's above the ceiling, all of that kind of information. Um, so this can be really critical and really helps uh, strengthen relationships with the client as well. Um, just to be able to provide this kind of data at the very end. Um, very easy to navigate, just go back through and be able to jump in and see from your open space capture, all right, what's what's down here? Yeah, and again, related to this, so at the end of the project, you can request this offline deliverable for the entire job, um, which a lot of customers do. The other way to do it is tying it back to those shared folders. What I did and what a lot of other GCs do is they'll create an owner monthly report folder and they'll walk strategically once a month, site's nice and clean, no one's there, and they'll put that full walkthrough into the owner monthly report shared folder. They'll grab that public share link and send it out with the owner monthly report so they have access to it. But at the end of the project, you don't have to download every single capture you've done. You can request this offline deliverable for just that shared folder. So now you have a really clean uh, kind of closeout package to turn over to the owner. Exactly. And, and a much smaller file size, uh, much more manageable. Um, and then the last thing I want to hit on uh, before we go to like Q and A is insurance savings. So um, Open Space over the last couple of years has partnered uh, with Open Space uh, or with the Shepherd uh, Insurance. Um, and, you know, here's what Shepard has found. We observed correlations between open space uses and improved claims uh, severity, indicating that open space not only helps reduce the occurrence of claims, um, but also the average size of losses. Um, there was a, a few different things here uh, hold on, that I wanted to highlight. Um, so uh, what they said was uh, it can result in up to 25% reduction in insurance premiums. And those savings are at the very beginning. Um, and so uh, every dollar spent on open uh, or uh, on insurance um, would save you uh, one to two dollar savings in premiums. Um, you know, they went through uh, thousands of historical claims uh, and they were able to show dramatic reductions in claim frequency, but also severity. Um, and the risk reduction is so significant that Shepard can offer uh, discounts to open space users um, up front rather than waiting to the end of the project. Um, so, you know, this is a new partnership we, uh, we uh, you know, publicly announced this back in June. Um, and so this is something that can really just 
you know, not only could you have open space, but it would just essentially be paid for. And that was really all I want to touch on with the insurance. Thanks, Rory. So we, we covered quite a bit in uh, just about a half an hour. We didn't want to keep you guys for too long. Um, now's the time. If you guys have any questions for myself or Rory or Natalie and John Henry, uh, feel free to send them our way. And Ginger, if there's any in the chat already that I missed, let me know. So looks like question came in. If you're utilizing models, at what point should you add the model and how does that work? So good question. Um, the way it works is you just drop your coordination model into project settings and that's it. Once you do that, the first alignment is going to take about 24 hours on our end. There's nothing more you have to do. And then any updates, if you guys are actively coordinating, will happen in a few minutes as long as your coordinate system isn't changing, which it typically won't anyways. Um, so I would say as soon as you have any sort of model, let, get that uploaded so everything gets aligned, and then you can continue to update that as you coordinate the job. More questions? Nothing? We'll give, give it another second here. Yeah, Boris, go ahead. Carlos, we can certainly, uh, we'll send out a recap of this meeting and the recording. Uh, you can reach out to Rory and myself and we can talk about um, covering that further. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, so Carlos. I'm excited. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so I don't work for the Russian construction company. I work for a uh, terminal operator in Belgium. And we operate large solar terminals. Uh, right now, we still do stock control by running the little around and not doing it in and do itself. We are plugged in to uh, go into the terminals around all the different types of coal and then make a meet. Perhaps so that you could see nice. Um, Hey, Boris, it's really difficult to understand you. Maybe you might want to type in the chat if possible. Uh, so we had a question for, uh, while you're typing that in, Boris, for Natalie or John Henry, whoever wants to chime in. Um, are your owners, uh, I guess, logging in or utilizing the data after the project ends? Yeah, so, I mean, in my case, yeah, definitely, I think the the biggest thing that people are looking for um, is blocking, you know, even uh, after the fact, you know, so we always make sure we do a very thorough capture, you know, for all the in-wall. And uh, another time when there were some changes after the fact, they asked us, you know, to go back to the data to see, you know, where the piping was so they could connect to some of the plumbing, you know. So from an as-built standpoint, it's easier to see. Uh, on the capture versus uh, just the uh, drawing. So definitely very useful. Yeah, and, and then to add to that from a um, operations standpoint, um, it's really helpful when we tag the submittals at the conclusion of the project, just for the operations team to have that visual um, operations manual is really easy. That if there's an issue with a certain um, you know aspect, they can go back and look at the actual uh, what was installed and uh, and problem solve for it. Thanks, guys. And Rory, I, I'm not sure we know the answer to this. Uh, in this, we can loop someone else in if needed, but there was a question about the case study with Shepard and if we've had similar conversations with other providers or, or brokers like Alliance. Yeah, right now, uh, Shepard is uh, the only one. Um, but you know, uh, I'm sure there will be others. Uh, and then in terms of being able to share the case study, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, Atul, I will get that information to you. Atul, well, you'll have our contact info. You can reach out and we, we can respond back to you with more information. Yeah. And there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Did you see those, Tom? Uh, no. 
So JR, coordination model question, during the course of our planning phase, the federated model changes rapidly. How often can we push models and is there any automation present capability uh, to roadmap? Yeah, uh, good question. So, so you can put, so I'll separate this into two pieces. With our core product, you can still use BIM compare. So that's just the side-by-side -side with the work in place. Um, with that core product, you have the ability to just upload a single federated file. Um, there, with that, there's no direct link to anything. You would basically download the model and then upload it to OpenSpace. And you can do that as however often you see fit. So if you're coordinating once a week or twice a week, you could do it right after that. Um, but there's no limit to how many times you can update it. And then to split it off to BIM Plus. So BIM Plus is that um, add-on product that offers uh, another slew of, of BIM-based tools. And with that, you don't have to just upload the federated model. You can upload each of your separate disciplines um, all separately. And then with that, we have the ability to link to Autodesk. So I'm not sure where you're storing your files, but if you are using Autodesk, then we can sync up to that and then, and then pull directly uh, your files in from there. And then Boris had a question around um, stock control for piles of coal. Not sure on that particular use case, but we could have our AMIA team reach out to you, Boris, and uh, maybe find out more um, to, to see if that's a good use case. Uh, Tom, and, you yeah, I mean, Boris, if you're just trying to document um, the different piles and, and kind of keep track of everything, then absolutely we can do that. Basically, if you can get the camera out there and go for a walk or strap it to something, then you can document the site and then you'll have that uh, you'll have that kind of Google Earth of whatever you're trying to capture. So I would say yes is the short answer, but definitely reach out to us. We can talk more specifics. And then uh, one last question here. Um, are there tutorials available at the onset of utilizing this project? Uh, product. Um, Lawrence, to, to answer that question, you can go to the Open Space website where there's, um, you know, Open Space Academy, um, and there's a whole bunch of different tutorials there that show you, um, uh, you know, getting started. It, it, it's kind of a crawl, walk, run, it takes you through um, just going out, getting your first capture, um, all the way through like uh, uh, features and tools, deep dive. So uh, you can find that on our website as well. And Lawrence, just to add to that, so you, you do have all those resources, we call it Open Space Academy. Um, but in addition to that, you also have, depending on where you're located, you'll have Rory and myself as resources. So we're not gonna abandon you. If you ever had questions or needed extra training for the team or wanted to do an onboarding with say all of your superintendents, you would just reach out to us. We'd, we'd set something up, we'd hop on a call similar to this and we, we would do the training with you. Any other questions? Well, I, I wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us. I especially wanna thank uh, Natalie and John Henry for, for volunteering to jump on. Um, you guys have been great partners with us. Um, really uh, happy to work with you and really excited about uh, continuing that.